In the last lesson, we saw that a uniform magnetic field can produce a magnetic force on a current carrying wire. Well, what if we have a current loop? We already know that in order to have any electric current in a circuit, it has to form a closed loop in some way. Of course, the loop might contain things like batteries, resistors, and so on. But we don't want to overcomplicate things, so let's just focus on the loop itself for now. It turns out that if we have a closed current loop, a uniform magnetic field doesn't create a net force on that closed loop. Using the right hand rule, we can figure out the force on each segment of the loop. We point our right fingers in the direction of the current or the charge velocity and curl them in the direction of the magnetic field and then our thumb points in the direction of the force at that point. Now all the little force elements on each segment of the loop just end up canceling out. So what's the point then? Was all the work we did in the previous lesson for nothing? Not quite. You see, while a closed current loop won't feel a magnetic force due to a uniform magnetic field, it can feel a net magnetic torque. We can see that in this circular example, the net force on the top side is pulling it in one direction and the net force on the bottom side is pulling it in the other direction. So if it were allowed to rotate about a specific axis, it would oscillate like this. It would swing back and forth between two extremes. Pretty elegant, but if we wanted to quantify the torque on this loop, a circle is actually a bit of a complicated example that probably requires calculus if we want to find it from scratch. So let's try a simpler example. I warn you though, despite that our next example is simple, it'll be more involved than you'd think. So be sure to follow along closely, and of course feel free to rewatch if you need to. Imagine we had, say, a square loop like this, tilted at some angle with respect to the magnetic field. We'll say each side has length d. Since each side has the current oriented differently with respect to the magnetic field, each side is going to feel a different magnetic force. So with that said, why don't we give each side a label? This one can be side 1, this one side 2, side 3, and side 4. Now we'll just figure out the magnetic forces on each side, one by one. Let's just worry about the directions for now. For side 1, the direction is just given by the right hand rule. Our force direction comes from L cross B. So pointing our right fingers in the direction of L, which is the same direction as the current, and then curling our fingers in the direction of B, has our thumb point in the direction of the force. This is the force on segment 1. If we want the direction of the force on segment 2, it's the same process. We have L cross B, so pointing our right fingers in the direction of L, which is the same direction as the current, and then curling our fingers in the direction of B, has our thumb point in the direction of the force on segment 2. Now, if you want, you can go through the motions for the remaining sides as well. But the only difference between sides 1 and 3 is the direction of the current. Everything else is the same, the length of the segment, the direction of the magnetic field. The only thing that's different is the current direction is exactly opposite. So then, if that's the case, it's just like having a negative I in place of the positive I. So the force is the same magnitude as side 1, but just in the opposite direction as well. Again, if you don't believe me, feel free to work it out using the right hand rule to prove it. For side 4, it's the same deal as side 2. Only thing that's different is the direction of the current is flipped, so all you have to do is flip the direction of the force on segment 2 to get the force on segment 4. So we can see that because we have forces that are equal and opposite for each pair of sides, there's no net magnetic force on this loop. That means the loop's not going to translate in any direction, its center of mass is going to stay put. What about the torque on the loop though? There can be a net magnetic torque on this loop, even if the net force is zero. Consider the forces on side 1 and side 3. Since they both lie on the same line of action, they don't produce a torque on the loop, they're just acting to stretch the loop, not rotate it in any way. Just as a review, the line of action of a force is just an infinitely long line that extends in both directions out of a force. If two forces are equal and opposite, they won't produce a torque on an object if they lie on the same line of action as they do here. They can only produce a torque if they lie on different lines of action. So with the two equal and opposite forces on sides 2 and 4, since each one has a different line of action, they do produce a torque on the loop. If, for example, we constrain the loop to rotate about this axis, then the forces on sides 2 and 4 cause it to rotate in a counterclockwise direction from this vantage point. In fact, if left free to rotate, it might rotate sort of like this. So let's recap for a second. Each segment of the wire feels a magnetic force due to the uniform magnetic field that exists outside the wire. Why? Because the individual moving charges within the wire each feel a force, so that force gets transferred to the wire itself as a whole. 
How do we find the direction of the force on each segment of the square loop? With the right hand rule, we point our right fingers in the direction of the charge velocity direction or current direction and curl them in the direction of the magnetic field and our thumb points in the direction of the resulting magnetic force. We see that on a closed loop, a net magnetic force will never exist, but that doesn't mean a net torque can't exist. On this loop in particular, a torque does exist due to the forces on segments 2 and 4, which cause the loop to rotate if it's not fixed in place. Now what is the actual torque on this loop? How do we quantify it? We've actually got a lot of things cluttering the screen now, so we're just going to get rid of the loop, the magnetic field, everything but the rotation axis and the forces that generate the torque. This is all we'll need to calculate the torque on the loop. If we want the torque on the loop due to F2 about the axis of rotation, we have to consider the position vector from the axis of rotation to the force. Why don't we call it R2? In that case, the position vector to the other force is just negative R2, isn't it? For the total torque, we have the torque on side 2, which is R2 cross F2, plus the torque on side 4, which is negative R2 cross negative F2. Remember, the force on side 4 is just equal and opposite the force on side 2, since the only thing that's different between the two sides is the direction of the current. Then the torque just becomes 2 times R2 cross F2, since the negatives cancel in the second term. Now, if we're just concerned about the magnitude of the torque, we can call it 2 times the magnitude of R2 times the magnitude of F2 times sine theta, where theta is the angle between the two vectors. If we cared about the direction of the torque vector in this configuration, we just use the right-hand rule and find out that it's out of the screen, or positive, quote-unquote, if this is just a 2D problem. Now all we need is the magnitude of R2 and the magnitude of F2, and we're sort of done at that point. Since we're just dealing with a square loop where each side has length d, the magnitude of r2 would just be half of that, or d over 2. If we want the magnitude of f2, or the magnitude of the magnetic force on segment 2, it's the magnitude of il cross b, so it's just the current through that segment i, times the length of that segment d, times the magnetic field strength b, times the sine of the angle between the current and the magnetic field, which we'll just call alpha to distinguish it from theta. In this case, the current makes a right angle with the magnetic field, so alpha is just 90 degrees, and sine 90 degrees is 1, so the sine term drops out. We could also see the current makes a right angle with the B field by carefully examining the original current loop we had in three dimensions. The magnitude of the force is then IDB times 1, or just IDB. Stitching everything together, we end up with the magnitude of the torque as 2 times d over 2 times idb times sine theta. The 2's cancel and we can group the d's together and we end up with the magnitude of the torque as the current times d squared times the strength of the magnetic field times sine theta. Of course, since we're dealing with a square loop here, we can say that d squared is just the area of the loop, capital A. Then the magnitude of the torque is IAB sine theta, where again theta was the angle we defined over here. So that was a lot of work to get to the final result, the torque on this current loop. You might be thinking, final result? How are we supposed to figure out theta? If we have to draw out the position vectors and force vectors anyway, what's the point? Don't worry, we'll come back to theta in a sec. Even though we only applied this to a square loop, the formula actually works for any planar loop where A is the area that the loop encloses, assuming a uniform magnetic field. So it would even work for that circular loop we had in the beginning, provided we know the radius and the current. So let's get to theta now. The angle in question is really awkwardly defined here, and there's actually a more intuitive way to define it. Let's start by getting rid of some extra stuff we won't need. Now imagine we define the area vector of this loop as a vector that's perpendicular to the plane of the loop and has a magnitude equal to the area. Then actually this theta here is exactly the same as this theta here, the angle between the area vector and the magnetic field vector. It seems impossibly slick, but really it's just the equivalent of rotating a coordinate system. If I rotate an axis from R2 to F2, it's exactly the same angle as rotating from the area vector to the magnetic field vector. That's not a coincidence, we're just taking advantage of the inherent geometry in the situation. 
Another way you could look at it is it's literally like rotating an actual coordinate system if you consider the position vector r is always perpendicular to the area vector by construction, and the magnetic force is always perpendicular to the magnetic field by definition. Now that we've established another way to find theta, we don't even need the r cross f stuff anymore. We've simplified things a whole bunch. So given all that we've done up to now, since we have the magnitude of the area vector times the magnitude of the magnetic field vector times the sine of the angle between them, there's actually a convenient way we can write the torque vector. The torque is equal to the current times the area vector crossed with the magnetic field vector. However, if we're going to use this vector expression, we have to be consistent. So it matters which way the area vector points, either up like this or down like this. Both ways are parallel to the plane of the loop, but which way is correct? Depending on which area vector we use, we'll get a different direction for the torque vector. The way we determine the correct direction of the area vector is using, you guessed it, the right hand rule. Only, it's a bit of a variation on the right hand rule. Normally we use the right hand rule to determine the direction of a cross product of two vectors. For example, if we want A cross B, the usual right hand rule would have our right fingers point in the direction of the first vector, A, and then curled in the direction of the second vector, B, and our extended thumb points in the resulting direction of A cross B. This variation is a simpler right hand rule. To find the direction of A, orient your right hand so that you can curl your fingers in the direction of the current. Then your extended thumb points in the correct direction of the area vector. Do you see how there's only one way this can work? If you try to use your right hand to curl your fingers to get A to point in the other direction, you might have a tough time. Now we're almost done, we just have a few knots to tie up. This expression, Ia cross B, it might look familiar to an expression we dealt with when we were talking about the electric dipole. Just to refresh our memory, the torque on an electric dipole due to an external electric field is P cross E, where P is the electric dipole moment and E is the electric field. So let's compare these two expressions. Electric torque is the electric dipole moment crossed with the electric field. Now in this lesson, we have magnetic torque is something crossed with the magnetic field. To keep all the analogies going, this something, I times the area vector, we call it the magnetic dipole moment, mu. Now be careful, this mu for magnetic dipole moment is different from that mu naught constant, which was 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7th something something units. So this is the convention for defining the magnetic dipole moment of a current loop. It might feel like we're just making up random definitions at this point, but let me illustrate why everything we've done up to this point is so useful. First, the magnetic dipole moment will show up again later in the next module when we're talking about atoms and electron spin. Next, if we want the torque on any planar current loop due to an external magnetic field, literally any loop you could think of, all we need to do is perform two steps. Step one, calculate the magnetic dipole moment, which is the current through the loop times the area vector. And then step two, calculate the cross product between the magnetic dipole moment and the magnetic field vector. That's it, that's, that's all we need to do to find the torque on the current loop. We don't have to deal with all that R cross F stuff we had before and perform a bunch of hideous calculations. Just two steps, find the magnetic dipole moment, then cross it with the magnetic field. Just really quickly, if we want to extend this idea to find the magnetic torque on a collection of loops bunched together, all carrying the same current, then the magnetic dipole moment of this combination here would be 3 times Ia. If it were 5 loops, then the magnetic dipole moment of this configuration would be 5 times Ia, and so on. In general, the net magnetic dipole moment on a collection of loops bunched together, each carrying the same current, is the number of loops times the magnetic dipole moment on a single loop. Pretty straightforward, they just build on top of each other. And again, if we needed the direction of the magnetic dipole moment, we just use our modified right hand rule. So curling our right fingers in the direction of the current would have our thumb pointing in the conventional direction of the area vector. Now there's one last thing we want to discuss. When we were dealing with electric dipoles, we were able to describe the electric potential energy of the dipole system in terms of the dipole moment vector and an external electric field. The rationale was that the closer the dipole moment points in the direction of the electric field, the lower the energy of the system. And we saw how this played out by considering dipole moments that had lots of stored energy and could swing back and forth rapidly if we let them go, 
versus dipole moments that were already pretty aligned with the electric field so had much lower stored potential energy as a result. Well, we can apply exactly the same rationale to magnetic dipole moments in a magnetic field. The potential energy in the electric dipole case we saw was negative the electric dipole moment dotted with the electric field. So the potential energy of a magnetic dipole system is negative the magnetic dipole moment, which we saw was Ia, the current times the area vector, dotted with the magnetic field, B. So when the magnetic dipole moment is pointing away from the external magnetic field direction, that's a situation of high potential energy. Why? Because the magnetic torque generated on the current loop wants the dipole to oscillate very wildly, which is analogous to our high energy electric dipole in an electric field. But when the magnetic dipole moment is pointing mostly in the direction of the external magnetic field, there is not a lot of torque that causes rotation. So any tendency to oscillate would be much calmer, which would be analogous to our low energy electric dipole in an electric field. And that's all for this lesson, folks. We went through a lot of dense material in this lesson, so if this one felt a bit heavy handed, don't sweat it too much. The rest of the lessons in this module should be a lot more easy going. We'll mostly be discussing a few interesting niche effects involving uniform magnetic fields. So I'll see you there.